without getting into too much of what is going on, we all realize what the crisis is all about. But the crisis really has impacted us in three ways. And before I get into it, all I can say is one thing. Let us not overrate the crisis and threat that we are facing. And let us not underrate our strength to fight and win. I repeat, let us not overrate the crisis and threat that we are facing. And let us not underrate our strength to fight and win. Now, think about it. This crisis impacts us three ways. One, our life. Two, our livelihood. And three, our lifestyle. Now, life is one part is, first of all, nobody knows amongst us who will be in quarantine next. Nobody knows. And two, what we do, where we go, and who we meet could be a matter of life and death. That is, we are all facing that situation. And number two is, is the livelihood component. All over the world you find there are job cuts, there are salary cuts, there are pay cuts all over the world. With the result, individuals have lost income, businesses have literally lost income, and there are some businesses that are closed permanently. And uh, at least in the restaurant trade, people are saying 40% of businesses are going to close permanently. And uh, the third part is even the governments have lost income because they're not collecting any taxes either. Now, with that scenario, I just want to bring in two things. And that is that who are the worst sufferers in the whole crisis? There are three kinds of people. One, the super rich. Two, the mediocre. And three, the poor. The poor are the worst hit. They're the daily wage earners. They work during the day, eat in the evening. Work during the day, eat in the evening. They're the worst hit. Now, then comes the super rich. Super rich, they don't have a livelihood problem. Folks, I just read Apple Computers has $250 billion in cash reserve. How can they have a livelihood problem? And similarly, there are people within the world and within India, the Adanis, the Ambanis, the Berlas, the Tatas, I'd be totally surprised if they also have a livelihood problem. They don't. But now that leaves the third party is the mediocre, where possibly people like me fall in, and maybe some other listeners, they might be falling in. Now, people who are the mediocre level, they are thinking one thing. Will the crisis finish before the money, or will the money finish before the crisis? That is a big question that is coming to people's mind. Now, with that is in People have started distinguishing between active income and passive income. See, active income is I go to work, I get money. I go to work, I get money. I don't go to work, I get no money. That's called active income. Now people are realizing that even if I don't go to work, I must get money. So we need to generate passive income. Now, we had another pension tax consulting practice in the U.S. where I sold my company, and uh, we used to plan for our clients that you must have one year of your income in emergency fund where you should be able to access that money within less than 24 hours. Why? Because emergencies and accidents never warn you in advance. But those who don't have it, it's a little too late. But going forward, they can do the planning accordingly. Now... The third part of the livelihood part is, I had a banker come to visit me the other day, and uh, I asked him, you're working with 30% staff. They're working at 30% staff. I said, are you working at 30% efficiency levels? He said, no, we're working at 60, 70% efficiency level, and we're looking to go to 90% efficiency level with 30% staff. I said, how do you manage? He said, all the people who are on Manual banking earlier, we're putting them on digital banking, especially the senior citizens. They were scared of technology, but now he said, we're putting everybody on technology and digital platform. Therefore, we are able to reach 60, 70, 80%, and we're shooting for 90% efficiency with 30% staff. So my next question was, if you're reaching 
90% efficiency with 30% staff, does that mean that when the crisis is over, the 60% staff will be redundant? You won't need them anymore. If you're reaching 90%, well, those are things that people have to start looking at it. But my next question was, I said, you are paying certain salary, whether salary cut 50%, 25%, and in, including, by the way, in, in Singapore, the manpower ministry has, has gone in and they, they are talking of 75% salary cuts, 75%. So my question was that whatever salaries you are pay, paying right now, are you getting equivalent work out of people? Can you justify that? So he said, sir, work from home, is it working all right? His answer was, sir, that 80-20 rule applies. And the 80-20 rule says that only 20% people can work without supervision. Only 20% people. 80% people cannot work without supervision. And besides, even if you give them measurable targets, you still need to chase them. So Sadly, I personally feel the number is not 80-20. Maybe in this case, it's 90-10. And besides, how do you work out from home in some industry like manufacturing? You can't. How do you work, work from home in a construction industry? You can't. There are some things you just cannot. And sadly, people who are not mature, they are thinking that working from home is a paid vacation. It is not. They need to understand working from home is not a paid vacation. Okay. Now coming to the third component is the lifestyle part. You see, till now, till the crisis came, till the lockdown came, all of us, we were all on the fast lane. Everybody was running, running, running. Now, we didn't know where were we were going, but we were going, everybody was going. We didn't have any time. Now, look at this. The amount of time-saving devices we have today, we've never had that many in history, and yet we don't have what? Time. You know why? Because somewhere we messed up our priorities. And I'm not preaching here just to give lectures. I'm guilty myself. And sadly, whenever we mess up our priorities, we forget to distinguish between what's urgent in life and what's important in life. Urgent may or may not be important and important may or may not be urgent. But the interesting thing is whenever we ignore what is urgent, important, it always converts into urgent. Now, health is important, but not urgent. Exercising every day is important, but not urgent. Now, if I have a crucial meeting tonight and if I cannot exercise, it's not the end of the world. But if I ignore my health long enough, guess what happens? I'll end up in the hospital. Same thing. In life, relationships are important, but they're not urgent. Now, if we ignore relationship long enough, guess what? We start talking to our lawyers. The funny thing is, whenever we ignore what is important, it converts into urgent. Now, important thing is that this lockdown has literally forced people to step backwards. Until now, we were all running, and now people are checking where we were running in the right direction. And now people have realized that direction is much more important than speed. I repeat, direction in life is much more important than speed. And one more thing that has come up is the difference between discretionary and non-discretionary spending. You see, now people have realized we always used to hear cash is king, cash is king. What did it mean? See, folks, it is better to have money in the bank than having 50 shirts in your closet. It is better to have money in the bank than buying a car worth quarter million dollars. Now they understand what did it mean by cash is king. Okay, so much for the lifestyle part. But let me just share one little thing. That the only comparison in history of this kind of crisis we have had is the Spanish flu, which I'm sure you must have heard a long time. So I'm not going to repeat that. And the other was the Great Depression of 1929. 
Interestingly, 1929, the banks failed, stock market crashed, people lost their savings, $100 became $15. I repeat, $100 became $15. Dollar lost its value by 85%. And 15 million people lost their jobs, only in US. Now, 15 million then is equivalent to 50 million today because the population in US was at that time only 120 million. And I just checked the figures last week. 51 million people are on unemployment list in the US. Now, what is the silver lining? Folks, the silver lining is that experience has shown that whenever unemployment has gone up, self-employment has always gone up. I repeat, whenever unemployment has gone up, self-employment has always gone up. And during that depression, there were some people who started their business enterprise then, and uh, today they are household words. Now, they had no money, no risk-taking ability, they were not educated people, they were not techies. But one thing they had was, they were positive people, they were solution-focused people. And, but there are some people who are problem-focused. You know what that means? You give them a solution, they'll give you a problem. They have a problem for every solution. Henry Ford said, kick them out. Kick them out. You don't need such people. But they were solution focused. And folks, they set up their enterprise then. And today they are household words. And think about it. How come under the same set of circumstances, some people break records while others break themselves? How come? Identical circumstances. So I'm going to share with you only three examples. One was a man by the name of George Jenkins. In his neighborhood, he started a little outlet for non-perishable durable goods. Now, these two words are very important. Non-perishable and durable goods. If they were perishable and they didn't sell, it would be lost. They couldn't take it. Durable means if they didn't sell, they could at least use it in the family. And this is how he started. But today... His turnover is $30 billion. His net worth is $6 billion. He has 1,000 outlets in the U.S. And the store's name is called Publix Supermarket. That's one. Number two, another man, the two brothers, Gallo brothers in California. They were struggling, but they got some grapes and started crushing them, made wine out of it. But nobody buy it. Nobody had the money to buy it. So they started selling the wine at 50% below market. 50% below market. Folks, that's how they started. And today, the Gallo wineries accounts for 25% of the wine trade in the U.S. And they're worth $10 billion. And the third example was a man by the name of Simplot in Idaho who had a small patch of land. He started cultivating potatoes. Now, what he couldn't sell, the family ate. And what he couldn't eat started rotting. So they could not afford the loss of rotten potatoes. So he started freezing them. This is how he started. And today, he accounts for 33% of the French fries business in the U.S., McDonald's being his largest customer, and he's worth $10 billion. Now, folks, I don't want you to leave with the impression that you and I, anybody starts and we'll all become billionaires. That is not the message. The message is very clear that they were solution focused. We need to be solution focused. I repeat, how come under the same set of circumstances, there are some people who break records and some people who break themselves, how come? Okay, now, this crisis has impacted us three ways. One is physically, medically, I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm not gonna talk about it too much. Two is economically, I want to talk about this one here economically. And people have started realizing today that bottom line is more important than top line. I repeat, bottom line is more important than top line. And the next part is that people have realized till now, the word was globalization, globalization, globalization. Now all of a sudden people are saying localization, localization, localization. Why? Folks, till now, 
the production was 20,000 miles away from consumption. And all of a sudden, people have realized, what if a country blackmails us tomorrow? They're 20,000 miles away. We're dead. Folks, I was surprised to hear that USA, United States, depends on China for 97% of the pharma products. 97%. India depends on China for 81% of the antibiotics. India depends on China for 70% electronics. So now people have realized all of a sudden that a country can blackmail us and we'll be gone forever. So consumption must come closer to production. Now, so much for that. Now, finally, physically, economically, psychologically. Psychologically is the emotional side. Folks, this is the most important part because people are facing stress. Anxiety, depression, frustration, and anger. I do a program called How to Turn a Setback into a Comeback, and over a million people have just gone through my webinars in the last 60 days. And uh, there I share with people that emotional stability is crucial. And folks, people who are emotionally strong, they, they are coming out stronger from this crisis. And people who are emotionally weak, they're falling apart. WHO came up with a report which said that domestic violence has gone up by 50%. Interesting. People who are emotionally strong, they're coming out stronger. Now, let me share since I don't have a whole lot of time, but I'm just going to share with you one thing. I cover nine steps, nine steps, how to overcome the crisis, nine steps. But I'm going to share only one right now in the interest of time. How do you overcome the stress level of this crisis? Folks, about 45 years ago, when I went to US, I attended a program by Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, the man who wrote the book, Power of Positive Thinking. There were a thousand people and I was one of them. Dr. Peale came, looked at everybody and said, you people appear so cool, calm, relaxed, comfortable. It appears nobody has a problem. Then he asked, does anybody here have a problem? Again, everybody raised their hand. Yes, we have a problem. Then he said, how many of you would like to get rid of the problem? Again, everybody raised their hand. Then Dr. Peel said, on my way here to this congregation, I came across a place where I saw some people where they were all stretched out, totally relaxed. They had no problem whatsoever. How many people would like to know where that place is? And everybody raised their hand. We want to know. So then Dr. Peel said, two blocks away from here, there is a cemetery. There are people lying there, all stretched out, totally relaxed. They have no problem whatsoever. And then he asked, how many people would like to get rid of the problem? Nobody raised their hand. Everybody put their hand in the pocket. Then Dr. Peel said something which is very profound. He said, problem is a sign of life. So long as we are alive, we shall have problems. The day we don't have problem, we'd be dead. And then he said, we cannot solve all our problems, but we can handle them. And folks, that day, he gave a prayer, which is called the serenity prayer. Which Frost probably not hears either. And some of you might have heard it before, but I'll share it twice in case People want to jot it down. It is worth it. It said. The prayer goes like this. God grant me the serenity. To accept the things that I cannot change. And courage to change the things that I can. And wisdom to know the difference. What I can and what I cannot. I repeat. God grant me the serenity. To accept the things that I cannot change. And courage 
to change the things that I can and wisdom to know the difference what I can and what I cannot. Now, folks, to me, this is the crux of life. It is the gist of life. And for the past 45 years, I have not left my home without my prayer. And I have faced many adverse situations, and this prayer has helped me overcome them. Now, if you analyze and dissect this little prayer, it goes like this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. Now, let me ask you, is everything in life within our control? Is there, I have control to change everything in this world? Answer is no. There are many things beyond, such as, I didn't choose my parents, neither did you. I didn't decide where I was going to be born, and neither did you. And if this is my height and this is the color of my skin, there's nothing I can do. And granted, sometimes people are born deformed. Sometimes bad things do happen to good people for no fault of their own. What wrong did they do? Who knows? How did this corona crisis come? I don't know. Nobody knows, but it's here. So all it says is, if I cannot change, let me accept it graciously, not grudgingly. Because many times in life, we keep fighting the things we just cannot change. And we bring stress into our lives and we become paralyzed and we become unproductive. So all it says is, if I cannot change, let me accept it graciously, not grudgingly. And two, if I can change, then give me the guts and courage to do it and wisdom to know what I can and what I cannot. Now, Folks, when I wrote my new book, which was launched last year in London, the title of the book is, You Can Achieve More. I took this thought two steps forward, and I wrote in my book that life is full of choices, and life is full of compromises. Seems like a contradiction, but not really. Now, how is life full of compromises? Folks, if I ill-treat you, I've chosen to be ill-treated, haven't I? If I treat you with discourtesy, I've chosen to be treated with discourtesy, haven't I? If I light up a cigarette, I've chosen to invite cancer, haven't I? If I drink and drive, I've chosen to invite an accident, haven't I? If I exercise every day, I've chosen to invite good health, haven't I? If I eat too much every day, I've chosen to be obese, haven't I? If I tell lies, I've chosen to lose my credibility, haven't I? If I tell the truth, I've chosen to be a credible person, haven't I? See, life is full of choices. Now, very important thing is, we are all free to the point of choice. But after we make our choices, the choice controls the chooser. We have no more choice. Now, how is life full of compromises? In life, we cannot choose the cards that are dealt to us. What we can choose is how we play the game. Folks, sometimes nature gives us a lemon. The choice is ours. Do we cry or do we make lemonade? That's our choice. Now, what is success? Series of positive choices in life is called success. And series of negative choices in life is called failure. And that's it. Now, many times people do ask me, Mr. Kera, people who are successful, don't they make mistakes in life? And people who are failures, don't they do positive things in life? And my answer to them is, that people who are successful, they do make mistakes in life. But remember one thing. Making a mistake once in a while does not make anybody a failure. Repeating the same mistake again and again is what brings failure. And doing something positive once in a while does not bring success either. Repeating the same positive behavior again and again is what brings success. So success is nothing else but series of positive choices in life is called success. 
and series of negative choices in life, in life is called failure. Now, folks, in the interest of time, I need to close because I do a one and a half hour program on this, how to turn a setback into a comeback, how to prepare to succeed and win, how do we motivate ourselves and others, and how do we overcome the crisis, the nine steps. But as of now, I would request Saurabh to take over the floor and uh, all the award winners, I congratulate everybody. God bless everybody. Stay good, well, good health, and that is important. So, please take over. Yes, thank you, Mr. Kira, for such uh, inspiring words. And it means a lot at this point in time where we all are under stress and uh, uh, prone to maybe making mistakes and uh, make uh, errors in judgment. So, thank you so much. Uh, we have little time left, so I'll request Mr. Ritu Maria to uh, take over and uh, then we can announce the awards. Uh, so, over to Ms. Maria. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Khera. It's always so brilliant to hear you. And I think in times like this, you know, when everybody is sort of trying to find the way out of the crisis, I think your words of motivation is going to help and go a long, long way to help support entrepreneurs and find, you know, light at the end of the tunnel, so to say. Thank you, Ritu. God bless you. And you people are doing a great job in building new entrepreneurs and carry on you and Gaurav and everybody at your end and wish you all good health. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Khera, somebody's asked a question. So let me ask okay. on his behalf. What do you suggest to a person uh, who is currently sharing his sales journey with aspiring sales professional as a sales consultant? So somebody who is helping, uh, who is uh, helping other people to increase their sales. Uh, you know, so he's in, in one sense a mentor. So as a mentor, what role you should play uh, today? Well, all I can say is that, uh, give me the question again. I, I think part of it got cut off. So uh, the gentleman is asking that, uh, you know, I, I am helping. It, okay, I'll read it out. Mr. Khera, what would you suggest to a person like me who is currently sharing his sales journey with aspiring sales professionals and the sales consultant? Okay. Well, look, uh, it, it's, a, it's a great thing that you're doing because people need help today. They need help badly. And sadly, most people who say they are salespeople, they are not really salespeople. They're only order takers, by the way. They are only order takers, and that is sad. And uh, the, the opportunity for any profession today, I don't care. I mean, you are a sales consultant, that's great. You are doing sales training, that's great. That's wonderful. I don't care what your profession is. I, I did a program for about a couple of hundred people and uh, it was a very mixed group. There were doctors, engineers, attorneys, accountants, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, and that's a very mixed group. And as I came in, I said, in the history of mankind has it been so easy to succeed in life the way it is today. Ritu, I'll repeat it again. Never in the history of mankind has it been so easy to succeed in life the way it is today. Regardless of your profession, we have no competition. When I repeated myself twice, one person from the group got up and he says, how come we have no competition? I mean, there's competition everywhere. And I asked this man a question that day. And I'm asking all of your listeners the same question. And my question is, how many people do you know right now walking off the street who are willing to do a little bit more than what they get paid for. I repeat, how many people do you know, know right now walking off the street who are willing to do a little bit more than what they get paid for? The answer is hardly any. Most people don't even want to do what they get paid for. And there's a second big category of people. They only want to do what they can get by with. And there's a very small fraction of people who are willing to do a little bit more than what they get paid for. And I asked him, if you fall into that category, I don't care what your profession is. Tell me, where's your competition? You see, you can't even find a good accountant today. You can't even find a good attorney today. You can't find a good carpenter. You can't find a good plumber. And so you can't find a good anything. The question is, are you willing to do a little bit more than what you get paid for? Now, if you look at life histories of people who have succeeded, 
and then sustain success. We do very important. Success is one thing, sustaining success is another. You succeeded, then sustained success, and then maintained goodwill. Yeah. If you look at life histories of those people, you will find they have lived by one philosophy, only one philosophy, and that is, I shall always give more than what I get to my family. I shall always give more than what I get to my organization. I shall always give more than what I get to my customer. And I shall always give more than what I get to my society. Sure, absolutely. You know, if, if we live by this one little principle, you tell me where's a competition? We have no competition. We become the competition for others. Now, I'm talking out of humility, gratefulness to God. Look, I come from a business family where 1,000 people working for us. The coal mines got nationalized. We came on the street. And when I left India, I'm not that educated. I'm a BCom third division failed in my 10th. That's my academics. Sure. When I left India, I started life in U.S. with a bucket in my hand, washing cars door to door for two years. Then gradually selling vacuum cleaners in the evening and daytime washing cars. And then got into accidentally into selling life insurance. And I was literally on the verge of being fired. But then was, there were some turning points, which when I go into my program, certain turn set back into comeback, I share what are the turning points. And uh, things turned around. I got into, moved on to U.S., got into three businesses. I bought out a company out of California in 1984, started a New Jersey operation with no clients, and I sold my company with close to 500 clients. Now, why do I share my life with you? The last 45 years have not been that easy. But, but here is. I'm grateful to God, and I talk out of humility. In the last 30 years, we have not made one outbound call for corporate business. That's great. I repeat, we have not made one outbound call for corporate, and we are doing business for Lufthansa, Johnson & Johnson, all over, all over. It has been inbound. And for every one client we take, we refuse three. You know, we are grateful to God. Why is it? Because our commitment, our commitment, why do our clients hire us? Not because we are the smartest people. There are many more qualified people than us. But our clients hire us for only one reason. Our commitment to our client is never 100%. It is always 200%. Tell me where's a competition. So my answer to this gentleman is in the sales training. My friend, just go do it. Sky's the limit size is also not a limit. It's an open field. Go do a great job and you keep moving one after the other. And that's about it.